whether you're going all the way up to source spirit or soul or all the way into the depths of your heart, if we can reach that place of openness, then we can um, get the guidance of our soul. Hi, I'm Rachel and this is Soulful Gangsters, the place to be on YouTube for spirituality and personal growth. <laughs> all right, so you are here to talk about the new earth. Uh, before we get to that, tell us like what it is that you do and how you started doing it. Oh my goodness. I am here to help the helpers, the people that feel like they look around at the planet and there's something that they're supposed to do to help. So whether they give themselves a title, light worker, healer, teacher, whatever, it doesn't really matter. I just want the people who are here to help to have the resources that they need to actually shine their light activate their soul gifts and support the world in their unique way well so in our pre-interview you said that you received prophecy at the age of eight so can you tell us about that so when i was eight years old i was just going about my business and randomly this beautiful light engulfed me and it told me that i was going to be a spiritual teacher and by the age of eight, I had enough of that protective ego that was like, what, me? No, 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 you, you got the wrong kid. It sounded too big and very scary and very dangerous. But the energy that was coming through with this light was that just perfect blanket of divine love and this feeling of inevitability. And the voice just chuckled. And they were like, when you're an adult. And I just was shown basically being involved with people across the globe and supporting them, teaching them. I saw myself on stages. I just felt like I was going to have this global audience. And I'll be honest, it scared the crap out of me, even when I was eight years old, because um, I'm 41. And back then we didn't have the internet. So being global meant you were like real famous. I just buried that prophecy didn't tell a single soul about it until I was in my 30s and I ignored it as much as possible and just grew up kind of figuring out what I was going to be I actually forgot about it I'm sure for quite some maybe I'll be a teacher maybe I'll be a therapist maybe like just going through all of these things and uh, it wasn't until I was in my late 30s that I was like okay I feel like it's time Okay, and you said that you get messages from Gaia. So when did that start and how did it start? Oh my goodness. Speaking with Gaia, Mother Earth, um, I think is something that I innately did, but I didn't always hear her as clearly as I do now. So I was initiated as a elemental priestess and creation coach uh, about 18 years ago. And when I was, we spent a lot of time connecting with the earth, rooting down into her and bringing her energy up and conversations just naturally started to, I guess, transpire. And I started to just speak with her. And then it became something that I realized was one of the most profoundly healing relationships in my life. I also realized that so many of us think of her as like a mother figure. Um, to me, she's honestly more like a friend and a co-creator. And she's very much more casual and hilarious. Like she's very jokey and way less serious than um, I would have expected her to be. So when I'm working with my clients, she'll often come in and she'll give messages that'll either come through me or they'll, they'll hear them. Uh, coupled with these beautiful waves of new earth energy and her higher realms that are so sparkling and loving, but her message is always very clear. Like, listen, you didn't come here to shoulder the weight of the world. That's my job. That's what I was designed to do. You are here to work and play with me, but let me take the burdens. She's a master alchemist, right? She can transmute anything. That's what creation on planet earth does. We go from um, something that's living and it will be at the end of its life and it'll decay. And then there's all of these processes, natural processes to break down the death and the decay into new life, right? That's plants and animals and fungus and bacteria are all involved with that. 
So she wants everybody to know that we can also energetically connect with her and give her the heaviness, the density, the stuff in us that we just aren't designed to hold. We're allowed to give that to her and she's happy to take it and transmute it back into light and nourishment for new life. That's interesting because I think so many people feel like the weight of the world is on their shoulders, that they have to, in this life, do something amazing, do something incredible. Um, the whole, I'm searching for my purpose thing and having that be a, a weight and a preoccupation and, and stuff like that. But how did it, how did it start? Or like, when did you first hear her voice or is it your voice? Um, how did you know that, how did you know who you were speaking to? And is it something that she talks to you whenever she wants, or do you sit down and start meditating and ask for, you know, answers to questions that you have? What's the process like to talk to Gaia? Hmm. So I most often will do it in what I call sacred space, where we do go into a meditative state where in, we're in coherence and connect down into the earth. But I also love aligning with our soul energy as well to bring that through and have this beautiful alignment where the energy can flow through us. I love to call in the luminous team to hold space for us. So we're just in a bubble. And what that sacred space process does is besides bringing us into heart mind coherence, it's also quieting the nervous system, which creates enough stillness so that we can hear the, the the whispers of what can at first be quiet, right? So it's easier to hear when you are with somebody or you're in ceremony and you're you're listening. And for me, because I am quite clear audience and clear cognizant, it's always just been like a conversation. Like she speaks and I hear her and the voice is not my own, but it is, it's not coming through my ears. It's my inner ear. It's coming up through my heart in I mean, this kind of telepathic communication contains these electromagnetic packages of information. So it's not just her voice, it's also the thoughts and feelings that are coming with it. That um, when you have opened up your psychic senses and you've learned to decode these electromagnetic packages, you're getting a, not, not just a voice. It's like you're getting her feeling, you're getting the sensation, you're getting a whole bubble of of the thoughts and feelings that she's sharing along with the information. And it's always just been that way for me. For some people, they can't quite hear it yet when I'm in this sacred space with them. Um, it's a feeling at first. And then a part of the training that I do with especially my one-on-one -on -one clients, but also my students is to help them hear it, feel it and trust it. And the techniques that we use first, including the sacred space or before that even, regulating the nervous system, getting out that stuck energy and that feeling of like the weight of the world on your shoulders or like, like that stress anxiety that cuts off our ability to hear and to feel and to trust the information because your nervous system is actually what processes light. So any information coming from spirit is going to be coming through the nervous system. And if we're dysregulated, we put up shields. And so that information can't get through. And if it does get through, we're like, I, I mean, I'm making this up. I can't trust it because we're not in that coherent state. But yeah. also like she'll just come to me and she'll talk to me when I'm just doing something else now, right? Because I, I have that connection and that regulation normally. So might be while I'm walking outside, I might be in the shower, I might be, you know, in my bed. Um, as long as my mind isn't busy, she's definitely able to get through. Wow. All right. Does Gaia say anything about what's going on in the world right now, the polarity, the division, the wars, um, how it seems like the darkness is, is trying to maintain control while the light is trying to, you know, keep it down? Does she have anything to say about that? Lots, really. It's part of this process that we're going through right now, which has been a massive journey. So this has always been an experiment, an experimental plane for people to come and exchange information from all over the galaxy. And Gaia had this idea when we were, like before we were here in this physical realm and we were all just kind of planning it out, she was thinking that she would like to try 
physically ascending a planet instead of what normally happens where it's just a spiritual ascension and the physical forms don't actually come with. They're kind of just, they, they dissolve and the next stage of evolution happens in a non-corporeal form. And, you know, many billions of years ago, she's like, what if guys, what if we do it, but with the bodies? And there was a whole lot of different uh, beings that were like, I mean, why not? Like, let's come, let's, let's figure it all out. And we'll have earth as a gathering place for this grand experiment, a library, a garden where there's just, this planet is seeded with so many different codes from different civilizations, right? This was supposed to be a gathering place, but it was also very much a free will zone where everything um, was going to be up to us. And she wasn't going to interfere either. She was really just going to hold space. And we don't have to get into the ancient history of um, past civilizations and other times where we've tried this experiment, because this is not the first time, or even the first earth, but that gets very esoteric, um, where, you know, man and people really wanted to go through an experience of separation, of not feeling um, as connected because they wanted to experience their individuated sense of self. And a lot of things came into that, but that was basically it. People, beings, everything in the galaxy, everything in the universe wants to ex have experiences. And some of them are just out of curiosity and we don't know where they're going to lead us. So that separation led to more focus on self instead of unity. And um, the earth actually sank down into this 3D reality that we have been really experiencing for quite some time. Before that, we were in the unified field. So there was a descension that happened. And now we're in the process of basically shifting back up into, I don't like calling them dimensions because it gets confusing with like, you know, with space and time, but really more a higher, a lower density, a higher vibrational frequency where we can tap back into the unified field where people can all actually feel each other and work harmoniously as opposed to that sense of separation that's been experienced here for a long time. So yeah. she is, she's fine, by the way. She already has in her own energetic way created the new earth ascended realms. Like they already exist and you can tap into them and feel them. And the physicality now is catching up. I was going to say, when people, if people who don't know what new earth means or the age of Aquarius or all these things, can you explain like what it means for that new earth to be actually here made physical? What are the changes we can see um, in terms of hierarchy or patriarchy and moving into something that is much more either communal or feminine or peaceful, hopefully? What does it mean to be moving towards or helping to create the new earth? So I don't have full access to what it's going to look like or what it's going to feel like because we're still co-creating it. But I do feel like I kind of still remember the, the plan and the potentials and the future that we had expected. And it's not going to be this like light switch moment. And there's a lot of people who believe like there's just going to be this crazy like flash and then instantly everything is going to be different maybe that'll happen maybe it won't it's an inner job so what has to happen is individuals are going to restore their own capacity to connect with these higher realms and higher densities that are they're they're less dense but they're higher vibrational realms where we can feel connected and unified with everything where that communication with Gaia, with each other's hearts, with other spirits, with the trees, with the realms, it's just effortless. So we can actually feel and hear and know each other at this deeper level, which means that there is more peace because you know, if you're causing harm to someone else, you're going to feel it yourself. So it's way harder to start wars or murder or rape or pillage or do things because your heart is open enough to feel their pain. So it just kind of naturally doesn't happen um, but the number of people here on the planet who are going through this internal shift this internal alchemy to be able to feel that unified field and those um, those frequencies is already underway and it's 
this ripple effect that's happening where it's you know moving through but there's also a lot of things that are happening energetically physically to our planet with the grid structures and the ley lines and basically the the energy lines that wrap around the planet have also been altered to allow for this new experience of consciousness so there's just so many things happening all at once yeah so the idea of not being separate and seeing people as you know we are one or we are the same or we are connected I'm guessing that the most important emotion that we can begin to feel or practice is compassion. Would that be right? One of the, for sure, right? Not sympathy, not empathy, where we're like, I'm feeling bad for you, or I'm feeling your feelings to the point that they are crushing me, because that can so happen with open-hearted people. But when we can stay in the energy of compassion, we can say, I, I feel with you, but I'm not going to let myself get stuck in that because if I'm suffering with you, I don't have my power and that compassion energy, like I'm going to do everything in my power so that you don't have to feel that way anymore. So then we can stay on purpose, on course, on path, on mission to do our own inner work and our own healing. And then from that space of alignment, do whatever our work is in the world. So compassion has an element of action that sympathy and empathy don't seem to of like, let's fix this. Let's get this work done. Let's, is that, is that what it is? How I feel that's how I define it. Right. I feel, yeah. I mean, compassion doesn't necessarily have to have action, but I think when you have compassion, it's very hard not to take action because you're, you, you can want to help. But what I see the most in my friends and other light workers and people that are here to help is that they can have so much sympathy and empathy for other people that they will be literally frozen and absolutely crushed by the heaviness of the pain and of the suffering, right? So it's not that those are bad things, but they're not going to allow us to be able to do what we need to do here on the planet. So there's a phrase that a mentor of mine uses where she says, we care, but we can't carry their, the weight of the world, right? We can't carry their suffering in our heart because then we just won't have the capacity to, again, do what whatever we're here to do. And everybody has a different piece of the puzzle, whether they're working on um, supporting the environment, supporting people, healing, um, you know, feeding people, peaceful things, helping, you know, the trees yeah. and the animals and everything. Everyone's got their own little piece. But when you are absolutely paralyzed because of other people's pain, then you're no good to anybody. Um, what does it mean to have a protective ego? The ego in a lot of spiritual teachings is like meant to be killed, right? Like ego death. I have never thought that at all. I think that, you know, the ego is the part of us that's trying to keep us safe. It doesn't have all of the information that the soul has. It is just purely focused on survival. And so the devil that we know versus the heaven that we don't know is what the ego will always choose. Because new things traditionally are not safe, right? New means danger. And this is something that we evolved with, right? Things that were outside of the norm, we didn't know they could hurt us. So humans have this evolutionarily um, protective ego that is basically just trying to keep us exactly where we are, safe, hidden, you know, and secure. So anytime something from outside including a message from soul spirit higher self soul mission that kind of thing or a dream that's on your heart comes through you know we might be like oh yeah i want to do it but then there's a part of us that goes like oh my gosh but then huh, i don't know because all of these things could go wrong and then people are going to see me and then people might judge me and then people might hate me and they might exile me and that's not that's not safe so let's just not right the ego is there to try to keep you safe and secure. So our light and our potential from our soul usually scares the crap out of the ego. So the ego is there to keep us safe, but at the same time, if it wants you to stay in the exact same place, there's no growth. And it also would keep you separate. It wouldn't allow you to see someone as the same as you. So what is the, I love talking about the ego. Um, what is the process, I guess, um, of 
understanding that the ego is here to keep us safe. And at the same time, becoming aware of it to the point where you can say, okay, I need to, this is obvious, you know, everything's okay. Um, and not allowing the ego to keep you from growth, spiritual or personal, and not allow it to keep you from reaching out to someone who is different from you and thinking that they're the other, which is creating so much of, of what we're seeing. So what's the balance? Oh my goodness. I love talking about this too, because it really <laughs> has all of these different realms that are within us. And a big part of it is using both your, your conscious mind, um, as well as your nervous system and making sure that you are supporting those pieces to, to be relaxed and stay open and have your heart open, which is easier said than done, but there's a lot of nervous system regulation and belief repatterning and things like that that can be done to support that. And then if we are able to shift the old energies and programs and beliefs that are making us feel like we have to stay stuck and have to stay small, and we can create enough space internally that we can like actually hear our heart or our soul or however you want to describe it, then the soul can come and be the guide, right? If we don't feel safe, we put up those shields and soul feels separate from us, right? Spirit feels separate from us because we're cut off from that source of energy. But if when we're in the open place, when we're in the space of stillness and peace, always at the center of it, there is this energy of love and connection and unity. So whether you're going all the way up to source spirit or soul or all the way into the depths of your heart, if we can reach that place of openness, then we can um, get the guidance of our soul, right? And then when it does come through, it might, again, scare the ego and we'll start to put up the walls and start to go, oh no, I can't and have the beliefs in our mind going like, but I, it's not, I'm not able to do that. And it might not be ours. So there is this constant with every layer of growth and evolution we're doing, new level that we'll reach where we have to support on all levels and layers, the nervous system to be regulated, uh, feel the feelings, but don't get stuck in them, shift any beliefs that we notice that are coming up, they're unsupportive to being able to have the growth and the connection and reconnect with soul. Yeah, I don't think complete separation from the ego is is the right thing to do. But at the same time, the awareness of it, where you can say, why am I getting offended? Well, you know, because um, I think that people who get a, who choose to get offended easily, they have, you know, they're <laughs> from whatever someone might say. Um, I think there has to be a self-aware, a, a modicum of self-awareness um, where you can allow the ego to protect you and this, at the same time know when to set it aside. Yeah. So you work with people who want to uh, change the world. What is the, or help heal the world? So what is the biggest problem that you see that they have? Is it their ego keeping them safe? Or is it uh, um, like, it seems too big a project when there's so much going on? Like, what do you hear over and over again from the people that you work with? It usually is all varieties of, programming at the ego level, the mental level, the physical level, the nervous system, where they're like stuck in the, I can't, and I don't know how, so I can't. It's too big, so I can't. Um, or I don't know how to do it perfectly, so therefore I can't. I don't know where to get started. Overwhelm, stress, um, all of those things, which tie into ego, nervous system, thoughts, beliefs, all of those things that again, might not even be ours because, you know, as kids, we're like, I can do anything, right? And it's usually other people's words that actually have us shift what our dreams are into something that's much more attainable because attainable, yeah. reasonable, yeah. rational dreams, those feel much more safe and secure for the person. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I help people with is the who programmed your computer, um, you know, parents, siblings, teachers, society, generation, religion. Um, what were you told about yourself that you don't agree with all that stuff? So that is what keep that's what's keeping a lot of people from doing what they need to do. Um, yeah, I know for me, it was actually the a, a similar but different one, still the ego, though, where I had this 
feeling, this innate sense that I could do anything that I wanted to, but I should keep my dreams really reasonable and rational so that I, I'm not too greedy, right? I shouldn't. Be wow. Greedy. Yeah. So stay small. Keep it small enough. Yeah. Oh man. A lot of us received that message. A lot of us, mm -hmm. um, or the message of, you know, don't believe in magic, be practical. Don't, don't think too big and, and too amazing. Just shh, shh. Yeah. So tell us about, um, a little bit more about the course that you offer or the courses that you offer and your services and tell us about your social media, where we can find you and, uh, your website. Yeah. The, place where I love to invite people the most would be to, um, if you happen to be on Facebook, to my Luminous Evolution group, where I have lots of free content, and that's a great way to stay in touch with me. So the Luminous Evolution on Facebook, you can search up, and I'm the Luminous Evolution on TikTok and Instagram, as well as Facebook. So that's where you'll find me. And um, I have a few different ways that I can support people, just depending on where they're at. The one that I'm most excited about right now is actually sharing uh, the energy alchemy modality that has been channeled through me where I can take people into the, that sacred space so they can hear the information from their team and they can we can clear out all of the old stuff, whether it's from the, the computer in the brain or from the Akashic or collective or ancestral or you know, personal realms, and we can do that with light and sound frequencies. So that's what I'm most excited to share with people. And I'm doing that through my, um, yeah, luminous alchemy or evolutionary alchemy programming. And uh, we'll be launching that again, coming up here in uh, May, I believe. I have the most hilarious way of connecting people to their soul energy and sharing it with the world through light language. And I have a quick little masterclass that says uh, basically three secrets to activating your light language so you can speak from the soul. And it helps you uh, not only just activate that capacity to express yourself, but channel your soul energy, come into that kind of divine flow where you can hear and feel more. It activates your psychic senses and also offers like healing and clearing um, to your own energy and anyone that hears it too. So that's a fun way of dipping into the work yeah. that I do in a small way. And just before we can really do our soul work out in the world, we have to do the inner work so that we are stable and clear enough to be able to hear what we're actually supposed to do. But we're never going to get all of the steps. So a lot of people get paralyzed in that spot where like, they be like, I have this vision, I know where I'm headed, but I have no idea how to get there. So I just, I guess I'll have to wait, or I guess I can't. Like you take one step and the next step will appear. So we're not ever going to get the complete map because that would just make this game too easy. So yeah. start where you're at. Yeah, I think it's uh, really good for people to uh, understand the concept of changing your energy uh, your micro energy in order to change the macro energy because the idea of changing the world seems too huge and scary but if you can work on yourself and your energy starts to vibrate differently then that's going to affect the people around you and that's going to that ripples out into the entire world so the best thing you can do is to heal yourself and to work on yourself personally and spiritually i agree <laughs> absolutely and honestly that's all we ever really have to do at all right? We really tap into our beingness and learn to live from that place. And then the doing happens so naturally, naturally and effortlessly and with all of these synchronicities to support you. So if it's feeling really tough to do the things, if you do that inner work so you can find the flow of your soul energy, then yeah, you'll, you'll come into the space where it really is easier to, to change the world. But yeah, change yourself first. Be the change. And then mm -hmm. let everything ripple from that place. Yeah. Right. Fantastic. Casey, thank you so much for being here with us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for having me.